Hi, welcome back everyone. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Matthew Rosen as the next speaker. And uh, Matthew has a, uh, an admirable diversity of topics that he's covered in his publications. Uh, topics like hyperpolarized MR with xenon and helium, uh, MR, um, sorry, machine learning based image reconstruction methods, MR fingerprinting. Uh, and then on top of that, I learned yesterday that he plays the Sarad and has been playing it for years. That's a, a classical Indian instrument. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Matthew Rosen. Next time we'll have to, to play. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in my group along machine learning uh, and biological analogs of perceptual learning uh, to reconstruct imaging data. So. Uh, this is work that's done in my beautiful sunlit laboratory at the MGH Martino Center in what used to be the timber shed of the uh, Charlestown Navy Yard. Um, so we are an MR physics lab. We have, we're a little kind of unusual in the NIH world in that we have funding from a variety of sources and we do all sorts of weird things, some of which you mentioned. Uh, depending on how you know me, 25 or more years ago I was doing work with hyperpolarization which is really about transferring angular momentum from a place you have it, typically photon fields, to places you want it, typically uh, nuclear spins. But in the last 10 years, we've had a very serious effort in my group around low cost, portable MRI, uh, mostly focusing on millitesla MRI. So I'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, kind of as a motivating thing. But I think the bulk of my talk is really going to be about uh, AI-based reconstruction approaches, namely the automap formalism. So this crowd knows this, but you know, why do low field MRI, right? Especially with the talks we heard this morning. Well, we know MRI is a sort of undisputed standard of care in particular for neuroimaging, but also other organ systems. These systems are expensive, heavy, uh, and operate for this point critically in a controlled access environment. So if you would like to do imaging, say, in the uh, field forward situation, military battlefield, or uh, other outside of the radiology suite areas, these high field scanners, and it doesn't matter if they're electromagnets or permanent magnets or superconducting magnets, they're dangerous, right? And some of my early work was funded by the DOD who was interested in actually this type of work. And so that leads you to, to understand immediately the motivation for doing work at low field. So we work all the way at the other end of the spectra, six and a half millitesla. This is a scanner that was built uh, by me and my then graduate student Leo Tsai in 2004. It is a high performance electromagnet, six and a half millitesla. Um, it's an eighth order magnetic field, so there are four coils, two per side, that make the main field, and a very linear, although weak, one-ish millitesla per meter uh, gradient set. Um, this system costs around 200K to put together. I'm a physicist, not an engineer. If you want to build one, you could do it for cheaper. It's not as cheap as the magnets sold down on Canal Street, um, which I saw the other day, but okay, it kind of gets you going. So, you know, you can't just turn the magnetic field down in MRI and expect to get any good images. And as many of our speakers have already said, it's because we use inductive detection, right, to sense the vanishingly small uh, nuclear polarization. And Richard Ernst refers to this as the power of evil in NMR. That is, nuclear magnetic moments are very, very small. So if you want to make images like this over reasonable acquisition times, you need to increase the only thing you can, which is magnetic field, since you're not going to cool the subject down. And so typically we operate at 3T. So how bad is this effect as a function of magnetic field strength? Well, let's look at the dependence of signal to noise with field strength. So of course, the voltage you detect, it's just dB dt, right? So that goes like B squared. Um, but in our regime, we are Johnson noise dominated. So this may be uh, unusual for those of you who build coils for high field scanners, where you're typically body noise dominated. In our low frequency regime, you were Johnson noise dominated. So the resistance in the coil, the noise voltage in the coil is what sends the noise limit. And that goes like root uh, KTR per unit bandwidth. And so for a tuned circuit, there's a relationship between R and omega. And so the SNR ends up going like B to the three halves. That's a pretty strong function of magnetic field. So you know, what sort of images would you expect to make at six and a half millitesla at around 500 times lower magnetic field, which is around 10,000 fold lower SNR? You'd probably expect you'd make images like this, and you'd be right, and nobody is impressed by this. This is, this is um, again, my former student Leo at Tsai back in 2005 when we were doing hyperpolarized gas imaging, and we had tons of SNR because that came from the externally applied uh, hyperpolarization. And we wanted to see if it would be possible to do a proton image. This is his head, if you could tell, two views. 
And this took about an hour to require. It's a single slice, and again, nobody cares. So, you know, the DOD, again, was really interested in this idea of portable MR, and so we really needed to examine where the, the roadblocks are in terms of SNR. So let's look at how you build a pulse sequence if you have to do signal averaging, right? We all know the SNR goes like the root of the number of averages, okay? And so to do a reasonable brain image in our lab, we have a pretty small matrix size, 64 by 75 by 15, about 30 averages, so that's around 3,400 acquisitions. So let's just look at broad classes of pulse sequences. So let's look at a gradient echo, 3D of course, because 3D is more efficient than 2D. So the nice thing about the gradient echo is you'll do a tip, let's say a 90 degree tip angle. You'll sample all of your magnetization, but then you gotta wait for T1 to do the next shot, right? And it is true that at low field, T1 is shorter than high field, but you're still waiting something like a significant fraction of a second between shots. So to do this many averages, you're taking around 40 minutes, and, and that's not great. Right? Especially for what in the end is going to be a, let's call it medium resolution image. Let's not say low resolution image, please. <laughs> so the other approach right, is flash. Flash is good because, well, fast is in its first name, right? Maybe that'll help us. So the idea, of course, behind flash is that you, you tip with small tip angles so you don't perturb the longitudinal magnetization. And then you crush whatever little transverse magnetization is left after each shot. So the nice thing about that is TR is limited by your hardware, not by T1. And so in our system, you can pulse about 30-fold faster. But remember, sign of alpha, because you're only tipping with a small tip angle, is, is quite low. And so actually, you need to do more signal averaging just to get back to half of where you started. And so in the end, gradient echo, flash, they're all about the same, and they're all terrible. Um, and so we had a realization around refocus sequences. So typically, things like balanced steady state free precession. And the idea, of course, is you know, gradient echo, but you rewind all the gradient moments, so there's no net gradient moment across each shot. So it's refocused, right? So that means then that you can get to some steady state magnetization across multiple pulses, and that steady state value can actually be quite high. So it has all the advantages of flash and that we can pulse very rapidly, uh, but that we don't have to wait for T1, and we don't have to wait for uh, extra signal averaging. So graphically, we all know how SSFP works. You tip some angle alpha, plus minus back and forth, you come to some steady state value over multiple pulses, and you have a very high data rate at which you can build up images. And you sort of come up with three rules, really, for doing low field MRI, because I know the show of hands, how many people want to do this work, right? But in case you do, um, these are the sort of rules of life, uh, and also rules of MR. One is, if you have small Boltzmann polarization, try to sample all of it, um, because there's just so little. Don't waste anything, so don't crush. Any little magnetization that's left over, you, you really want to reuse it. And don't wait. If you're waiting for T1, you're, you're never going to get done. So Herman Carr, of course, 1958, he knew this, right? He wasn't doing MRI, but he was doing NMR, low field, and long T1 samples. So there is nothing new under the sun. So now in our scanner with SSFP, um, in six minutes, we can do the same matrix size I showed you before, roughly two and a half millimeter in plane brain imaging. And this is 50% undersampled. This is my former postdoc, Chris LaPierre. These are the kind of RF coils we use. Our B0 goes from ear to ear, so this is a spiral volume coil that makes a B1 axially. Compare this to what I showed you at the beginning, same scanner, right, different sequence. So that gives you a sense that, you know, software is really valuable, right? Okay, so we've extended this work we do fingerprinting, which I won't talk about today, but this is a nice way, again, wrapped in a refocused SSFP style sequence. We can get not only proton density, which is what those SSFP images are, but we can also get T1, T2. You can get field maps of various sorts, both B1 and B2. And this really is nice because it allows us to exploit a very nice thing about low field. There aren't many nice things about low field except that it's safe for shrapnel and this, which is that the T1 dispersion as a function of field strength uh, you get a lot of T1 dispersion at low magnetic field. So, you, so that's actually pretty nice for soft tissue contrast. Okay, so um, we've advanced from that spiral volume coil that I showed you, the acquisition, uh, the RF uh, with quadrature coils. This was built by my postdoc Neha. And this is a, the inner quadrature you saw before in the previous slide. The outer quadrature gives you B1 in the other orthogonal direction. These are decoupled mostly geometrically, but then very interestingly, there's an air core transformer where you can get about, uh, about 25 dB decoupling between them. That's nice, we get a gain of uh, root two and SNR. 
you know, so there's a sort of standing joke in my lab, right, that, well, you know, we can't improve the signal anymore. We're already getting both quadratures. We have the most efficient sequences. So can we just reduce the noise, right? I mean, who, just turn it down, right? Turn the noise down. And, and that's just a running joke until Boju, my postdoc, joined my lab about three years ago, and he took this very, very seriously. And, and so it's his insistence that this isn't a joke that I'm going to talk about for the remainder, remainder of my talk. In order to do that, I really want to go back and look at how you do imaging, uh, independent of modality, where you have a sensor. Uh, well, you, have, you start with an object, OK? And then you forward encode that into an intermediate representation. Let's call it the sensor domain. The sensor domain could be radon sinogram for PET or CT. It could be element time space for ultrasound. Or it could even be Fourier k-space or other types of k-space for MR. And then the reconstruction problem is simply inverting the forward encoding, right? So now let's look specifically for MRI, just to make it concrete. So MRI, what is the signal? It's very simple. That's why we all love MRI, because it's so simple. You have some object, right? You use inductive detection, the NMR part, to get a signal that you phase and frequency modulate by the application of magnetic gradients. So I've written down the forward model. We could all do this back when we were you know, wearing short pants. It's very straightforward. And we immediately recognize this as the Fourier transform. Right? So now that means the sensor domain is Fourier. And to make an image, you just invert that. What could be simpler? Right? This is why we love Cartesian MR. Well, there are other things that people do. Right? People do non-Cartesian sampling, such as spiral. You have to regrid the data as part of the inversion process. You, parallel imaging, there are coil compression and other nonlinear optimizations that have to be done. Undersampled things, you'll often do a conjugate gradient optimization, backtracking line search, other sparsifying things. Many of these things are iterative, right? They're not just analytic inverses like the Fourier transform. And so what you end up with, again, not just in MR, but in all imaging, is a kind of a mess. It's a bit of a zoo where each of these colored boxes is someone's career, right? And you have this kind of ad hoc thing that you do to process the data as it goes from its native domain, like the voltages in your preamp, right, to the final image that you want. And this will remind one of speech, rec speech recognition kind of in the bad days, right? In speech recognition, what people would do is they would Fourier transform some audio, and then they would have some whole theory of language, right? OK, we're looking at Yankee English. Right? So let's extract the phonemes and the vowels and the consonants and how re things are represented. And then you give it to someone from the mid-Atlantic states and it, it breaks. Right? Again, this required handcrafted solutions for feature extraction. This whole thing changed, of course, with deep learning. Um, and the way you solve this problem with deep learning is very simple. You have some labeled data. So you have one speaker saying something. And then you have the ground truth as text. And you have a different speaker, maybe with a different accent saying something else. And you feed all of these things in to a deeper current neural network, which is a thing with tons of degrees of freedom. And then it gives you an output, right? And that output is wrong. So you use stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation to change the weights to get it so that it trains down and gives you the right answers. And you have to be careful to avoid things like overfitting. But this is a well-known problem that works incredibly well, right? And the difference between supervised learning and supervised for those who who uh, are unfamiliar with the word, means we have the data in one domain and the answer or the data in another domain. It's supervised. We have the ground truth. Right? The beautiful part of this is that there's some internal representation in here that solves this problem. And I haven't had to bake in an external theory of language. The data defines its own representation. Okay, And of course, Siri works pretty well. These approaches have solved lots of other hard problems, many of which are kind of inverse problems. Uh, many of which are in the medical space, which we all know about. And really, it's been a technological convergence. Um, of course, the algorithms have been around a long time. Stochastic gradient descent has been around a long time. But really, labeled data has really helped this problem, right? so-called big data. And the fact that so many people love to play video games, that NVIDIA has built this amazing horsepower, which allows us to do this work. Okay. So let me talk about another kind of learning. I was talking about supervised learning in synthetic neural networks. How about human visual learning? And Denis referred to this earlier, actually. I was quite happy to see. So perceptual learning is the way we as humans learn to see. We're born blind, 
Okay? Your eyes are not pixel sensors. What happens is you see some object and your brain learns over exposure to stimuli what features matter. And then in your mind's eye, in the visual cortex, you hallucinate what the object is based on reconstruction in sparse features, edges, patterns, and textures. Right? And it's actually this perceptual learning approach that's critical to biological vision's performance in low SNR settings. And you might think, what do you mean? Humans are, biological vision is weak. But think about this. If you took your cell phone camera and took a picture in this room right now, it would be a grainy picture. Right? But I don't see all of you, even with my poor vision, as grainy. And you might say, oh, the quantum efficiency of your eye is met better than in your CMOS sensor. No, that's not true. Even the cheapest CMOS sensor has a five times lower quantum efficiency. It's because the thing your brain sees or does with the sensor data is a hallucination based on features that you have learned over your lifetime. If you don't believe me, what is this? Right? It's a dog. Right? And you knew that because you've seen lots of dogs. And you know about continuity in images. Natural images are continuous. You know about features of dog and dog-like you know, fur and things like this. And so now in the language of signal processing, you took an undersampled or low SNR, if you want, image. In fact, this violates the Nyquist sampling. right? And you reconstructed it completely by hallucination. Okay? Hallucination is a funny word, and I keep using it because it's fun to say. But, but it's also true, right? And this is why, um, this is why optical illusions work, right? You know, you look at moving objects and then they stop and your brain still sees them move. Pixel sensors don't do that, right? So, they're, so that's kind of a neat thing. Okay, so let's talk about MRI a little bit, right? The cartoon of MRI, of course, is that you take some data and you have your reconstruction pipeline, which we talked about before, and you make your image. And as we know, MRI is pretty slow. And, and actually, <laughs> in my lab, it's really slow. So everyone wants to go faster, so you undersample. That's OK. Your, your brain's reconstructed that undersampled image just a moment ago. And you get some crappy thing, and, and it's unfortunate. right? So you know, the idea for this work is really to leverage this idea of perceptual learning, where you have a retinal sensor, you have neuronal spiking signals that the brain reconstructs using this data-driven approach, perceptual learning, um, to the world of MRI. And we call this AutoMap. So this is work that we published in Nature last year. Uh, and the idea is to just replace this whole zoo with a unified reconstruction formalism, where image reconstruction becomes a supervised learning task. And it uses two forms of learning, which I just talked about. One is the fact that all of these things, this big pipeline, can be replaced with supervised learning. There's kind of an existence proof of that, right? The fact that Siri works, the fact that all these other things these supervised learning approaches really work quite nicely. So, you know, the first, this is the, you know, the basic neural network formalism, which solves so many problems without handcrafting, right? Because this is all handcrafted, and we kind of want to get rid of that. And then the second um, archetype for learning is this perceptual learning thing, which improves the SNR, intrinsically improves the SNR of, of noisy data. Um, and so we describe this thing on this, in this sort of topological way, where we have a relationship of manifolds, OK? And we allow the relationship the reconstruction relationship between the manifold of the sensor domain and the manifold of, of image domain to be learned. Okay? And the forward model, which is the easy thing to do, that is how you go from an object to its representation in the sensor domain, the forward model is inverted by learning from pairs of examples. And I'll talk about this a little more. And, I, and when I say pairs of examples, we train this thing on cats and dogs. These are actually literally the things we train this on. Cats and dogs and their forward model. OK, this is very, very different from things you may know about already, like neural network, convolutional neural network denoisers, where you train, again, in a supervised way, noisy images and clean images, and you learn a mapping from noisy to clean. This is called noise training. Um, that's not what we do. In fact, what we do is we train on clean pairs, where we take an object and we forward encode it. OK, clean and clean. Everything's clean. And the network identifies sparsity in both of these domains, the image domain and the sensor domain. Those sparsities may be very different. I'll talk about that in a moment. And it then learns to reconstruct from the sensor domain back to the image domain operating on these maximally sparse domains. And the noise immunity in this case is not learned by noise training. It's that 
the mapping between sparse manifolds is inherently noise immune, like it is in the perceptual learning case. So I've said sparsity like, what, 20 times in the last five seconds. So, so let's talk a little bit, and there was a question earlier about sparsity. So I want to describe my definition of sparsity, which is really that high dimensional data can be represented with fewer coefficients in a sparse domain. And so here's an example. Um, oh, boy, that looks terrible. Um, so what this picture is supposed to be <laughs> are a bunch of different circles of different sizes. OK? And then we, uh, oh, well, uh, here's one in particular. So let's look in the pixel space representation of this, right? You, you have to write down each con contiguous pixel, depending on the resolution, this is what it looks like. But of course, how about circle space? Let's make something up, right? Well, we know that this data is circles. It has some x and y coordinate and a radius. So you can represent it with a triplet of numbers, right? So circles are sparse in triplet space, just to make up an example, right? Now, natural images are also sparse. This is a fascinating thing. Natural images are sparse. Well, they're not sparse in the image domain, right? It's an n by n matrix, right? Well, they're also not sparse in the Fourier domain. So that's, that's too bad. I just made this whole story about natural images are sparse, and your brain somehow operates on sparse data. So, so and I even give it a reference for this. So what am I talking about? Well, there are domains in which images are sparse. Many of you are familiar with this. Wavelet domain is one example. Right? So you transform this into the wavelet domain. Most of these coefficients are zero. Right? And what is the wavelet domain? It's basically, it's, you can think of it as edge detectors. Right? And, so, and this is how JPEG compression works. Right? You delete all the, zero, the coefficients that are zero, and you have a compressed, lossless version of your image. So the other piece of this is that noise, by definition, is not sparse in any domain. Connecting this world of sparsity because remember, our goal is to form a neural network-based analog of sparse reconstruction a la human perceptual learning, biological perceptual learning. We note that training of networks, when done correctly with things like dropout, um, can encourage efficient internal representations of the learned mapping. Right? So like in the case of speech recognition, you don't overfit. So you do things like drop out and you modify the input data so that you don't overfit. You learn a low dimensional representation. That is the same thing as saying a sparse domain. And then automap transform will operate between these data defined sparse domains and the image at the end is hallucinated from the learned convolutional feature maps. Let's talk about this in specific. So this is the very simple but very interesting network that forms the basis for automap. Um, and we call it neuromorphic, really biologically inspired, right? And it's quite straightforward. There's a fully connected, you have your sensor domain data on one side, out comes the reconstructed image, and um, when it's running, it's a simple feed forward network. Okay, let's look at it in, in more specific. And I emphasize this here, that what we're learning here is the transform between the two domains learned by example from the forward model and taking advantage of the fact that there is sparsity inherent in both of the domains and we're going to only operate in that domain. So let's look at the beginning of this network. The fully connected part of this is very important. And, if, and almost all work that you see in the literature about people doing image processing with neural networks, nobody uses a fully connected network because they're very memory intensive. And the reason we do it is very simple. As a physicist, I like math problems, okay? And it has been proven that you can represent any function bound on a compact set by a fully connected network with a finite number of neurons. That makes me happy because that's a proof that in fact the Fourier transform could actually be subsumed by this, as could other things. Okay? The other half of the network is more straightforward and, and typical. It's uh, two layers of a convolutional uh, autoencoder. And in particular during training, we force the last layer to have sparse convolutional uh, features through an L1 norm penalty. Now, trained, well, let's actually look at some of these sparse convolutional features. So this network was trained on the data I was showing you. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it, but natural images and their Fourier transform. And we, when we look at these sparse convolutional features that have been learned from the data set, you get things like this, and the neuroscientists in the crowd will immediately recognize these as kind of looking like our own receptive fields, the so-called Gabor filters of the human visual cortex, which is sort of a fun thing to come out. In this case, I want to emphasize that the sparsifying domain is learned from the data. We do not assume wavelet. Okay. 
So how do we train this thing? We take images of cats and dogs and houses from Google, right? We transform them using the forward model into your particular sensor domain, whatever you want. We corrupt that case space with multiplicative noise. This is different from noise training. In this case, this is equivalent to something like dropout, where we're promoting manifold learning. And then we input this into the automap network. And then the output to the network is given this, right? Uh, this manifold assumption actually is kind of interesting. Again, the reason that adding non-physical noise or dropout to the training process promotes manifold learning is because natural high-dimensional data concentrates near a low-dimensional nonlinear manifold. And that low-dimensional low nonlinear representation is robust to input corruption. So this is a natural way to, to sort of do this. So let me give a concrete example of how you do this. Let's learn the Fourier transform, OK? So we're going to take 10,000 images. This is one of them. And we're going to forward encode it into the sensor domain, Cartesian case space in this case. And then now that the network is trained and all the weights are set so that the output gives you the correct output from the input, we're going to give it the case space it has never seen before. So just so we know what it is, um, we Fourier transform it, and it's this particular flower. And we give that to the network, and in fact, lo and behold, it reconstructs a flower. Now, who cares, except this is very interesting. This very simple network architecture has learned how to do this double integral, or, or double discrete sum in this case, by example, right? It was trained on these exact things. OK, and then of course, if you give it a case space of a brain, which it's never seen before, that's fine. It also can reconstruct it. So if this is all AutoMap did, wait, there's more. <laughs> this would actually be really interesting, because it opens the way to reconstruct very difficult arbitrary encoding schemes. So if you come up tomorrow with some weird sampling pattern that's like, let's make something up, 25% spiral, 25% radial, 50% Cartesian, how on earth would you reconstruct this, right? Well, it's quite simple. You just write down the forward model, you train the network, and, and you can do that. So now, the real interesting thing happens when you have noisy data, realistic data. What we'll do is to show the performance of this network for data that has real finite SNR, what I've done is we'll take an image, we will forward encode it, we will now add noise to give it some finite SNR. This is typical Gaussian noise. And then we will take that and reconstruct it both with AutoMap and with a conventional approach. And it's nice because in this case, we have the ground truth, right? The uncorrupted, unnoisy image. As an example, let's start with spiral. So we took this reference brain image, we Fourier transformed it, and we, subs and we sampled it on a spiral pattern. We added Gaussian noise to bring the SNR to around 25 dB. And we reconstructed it using a typical conjugate gradient sense with NUFT. 30 iterations, right? An iterative reconstruction approach. And it has some SNR and some root mean square error when compared to the reference. And AutoMap on the same data does this. It's about a factor of three better SNR. It's about a factor of three better accuracy when compared to the reference. Now we could go into this in great detail, but I think this slide is more interesting. So it doesn't seem to matter what encoding you use. Right? You can train it on radon, on spiral, on undersampled Fourier, even on echo shifted EPI. In all cases, the SNR for the AutoMap is roughly a factor of three higher than in the conventional approaches. And some of these, you know, some of them are FT, some of them are conjugate gradient sense NUFT, some of them are NBIR, and here's a Mickey Lustig uh, compress, uh, compressed sensing approach. In all cases, the performance is better. Now things get really interesting when you add even more noise. So here's, again, our friend the spiral. I've added enough noise so that the SNR is around 5. And again, you get, you get tremendous boosts on the reconstruction, again, with, with lower error. <laughs> and so where does this robustness to noise come from? Well, it's really about this low-dimensional internal representation. right? So this transform doesn't act like a normal mathematical transform. If I have a Fourier transform, I take data and I operate on every piece the same, right? In this case, remember the manifolds, there's a, one nonlinear manifold that subsumes K space or sensor domain space and one nonlinear manifold that subsumes image space. Those manifolds through training are conditioned to be maximally sparse 
in their own domain. Remember what we said about sparsity. Noise is not sparse. Right? And then the relationship between those manifolds is inverted, again by example, on those manifolds. So the transform to sort of zeroth approximation doesn't operate on noise the same way it operates on signal-like data. Kind of a neat thing. Um, so here we are at ultra-low field. Um, that's a place where we can generate low SNR data all day. So this is some work that my postdoc Neha did. So this is single slice in a structured phantom. She did 800 averages. Has anyone ever done 800 averages in this crap? I don't think so. So this took about 26 minutes to acquire. Pretty good SNR. In fact, the Fourier transform of this and the auto map, they look about the same. But as we take less and less data, moving to the left, you can actually see that you know, down here at 40 averages, the, the, the FT looks terrible. But you can actually recover a lot of the details here. Just this is a plot of the ratio of the SNR as a function of number of averages. So the place AutoMap really shines is when you are SNR starved, because it's going to reconstruct that data with an eye, no pun intended, to the fact that it knows, because it's been trained, that the data in the sensor domain is going to be case-based-like or signal-like, and that the final result is going to be image-like. OK, here's a fun thing. Uh, we have a project in my group that's a collaboration with Texas A&M that is building uh, portable MRI scanners that go in the ground in College Station, Texas to image plant roots. It's kind of an amazing thing. And so here's another example. These are some plant roots, sorghum roots in the ground, and again, reconstructed with AutoMap. You know, one of the things that, that gets people who are familiar with, let's call it formal mathematics, <laughs> for lack of a better word, or Bayesian approaches, it gets them all upset when they, when they say, well, what the hell's going on in here? Right? It's just a black box. Right? And I, I try to kind of push you in a direction to maybe feel kind of comfortable about this black box by saying, well, there's a proof here and there. We know the convolutional features here. But that's not really, I mean, that's, that's part, of the, part of the process. But I think there's, there's more to be learned from what's actually going on in here. So I claimed that this sparse internal representation of the relationship between the, the domains is why this, is so, this works so well. So let's interrogate what we can do. So, we're going to, so in this case, we train the network on ImageNet, again, cats and dogs and birds, just like this. And then I'm going to feed it now the image of a case space, and we're going to look at the activation of this first hidden layer. And it looks like this. So keep that in mind, OK? So that's that first hidden layer, and this is the reconstructed image, and it has an SNR of 27. Remember, this network was trained on the forward model on natural images. We could have trained the network, very interestingly, on Gaussian noise, 10,000 different Gaussian noise images, and the Fourier transform of 10,000 different uh, noise images. That's fine. And in fact, we did that. And now if you look at the activation of that first hidden layer, it's less sparse, for sure. And the reconstruction performance, SNR is around 18 versus 27. So in that case, the conditioning of this manifold doesn't really happen, right? Because the network was trained on the pure mathematical transform, right? There are no sparse features to be learned in either domain. So all you're really learning is the mapping between those two domains. And as a result, the performance for noisy data suffers. Now, of course, you all realize what the next step is going to be. You could also train on images of brains and the Fourier transform of those brains different brains to learn the more detailed and domain specific sparse features of, those, of that data set. And in fact, you get a little bit of an SNR boost. And again, you see that the activation of that sparse layer, uh, excuse me, of that hidden layer is more sparse. So this is kind of one hint into the idea of this conditioning of this hidden layer and operation between learned sparse manifolds. The other thing we can do is a, a T-SNE. We can look at the locality of the network weights. So this is the t stochastic t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which is a way to visualize uh, these weights. And you know, this is a, for those not familiar with this metric, um, what it really does is it tells you how the weights in the hidden layer relate to each other spatially. Okay? And so for the so-called noise trained or neutral Fourier transform, as I said, there is no topological relationship between adjacent pixels or, or edges or any of that stuff in the source data. So the, the T-SNE is flat. And then as you increase the domain specificity, you can see that, oh, I see that the weights here respect 
spatial correlations in the data set. And this should remind you a little bit about this topolo of this topological uh, view we have of the way that, that Automap operates. So this idea about domain-specific training is really interesting, right? We get a performance boost as you train on things that are more like the data you're going to finally reconstruct. And I should say, you know, these are just pictures. This was trained on pictures of brains, not case based of brains, right? We just went to uh, an MR database. We got images of brains, and then we forward encode them. I talked about the Roots project before. Here's another example. This is work that Neha's working on. So these root images were reconstructed using Automap, trained on, I think, actually on brain images, OK? But, but of course, as you get more domain specific and train on things that have the same kinds of sparsity that the data set have, you'll do better. And so this is a project. I don't have results to show you. But these are synthetic vasculature um, images that were generated from a piece of software. And so the idea is you could generate things that kind of look like what you want so that the appropriate sparsity can be learned, and then train the network that way. OK, so wrapping it up, um, Automap is really this, this sort of new approach, really. And it's a unified reconstruction approach. Um, that, that leverages the fact that you can represent functions using fully connected layers. And manifold learning um, is a way to, through supervised learning and appropriate dropout, to um, learn these sparse representations for, the, for operation in the network. Um, there is no imposed expert knowledge. Again, all of these things happen. The network doesn't know what a Fourier transform is. It doesn't know what spiral sampling is. It's just presented with pairs of data it learns the relationship between them, conditioned on these mutually sparse manifolds. And it kind of changes the game, at least for us at low field, because it's so immune to noise. We're also looking at high field data that has low SNR, like high B value diffusion data, for instance, um, as well as plant roots in the ground, which is sort of fun. Uh, and then, of course, faster scan times. Again, this is not just for MR. You can use this for anything you want to do. Um, one of my students is working on this for, for CT, right? And it's nice to do a real-time reconstruction, because this is all feed-forward. This is non-iterative. Okay. And uh, the thing I'm probably most excited about, which if you're at the ISMRM, uh, Bo Zhu is going to talk about, is that this idea of new acquisition strategies, you know, I made up this sort of toy model of 25% spiral, 25% radial, whatever I said. But actually, you can come up with really interesting things. You can have generative algorithms and AI agents that discover new pulse sequences that might be difficult to reconstruct. And as long as you train Automap during the process, you can actually do that as well. So with that, I want to thank uh, members of my group, past and present, and our funding agencies. And thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Uh, do we have any questions? And yeah, wh whoever has a question, just please come to the mic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, beautiful work, Matt. Yeah. Oh. Hey. oh, you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so have you taken? the reconstructed images that are noisy and run them through a denoiser or maybe even purposely trained a denoiser on combinations of noisified and uh, non-noisy data and compared how much of a uh, SNR improvement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so let me make sure I understand your question. So are you saying reconstruct to the best that we can, because we train end to end, and then on top of that now add a typical convolutional denoiser? I'm saying. Here you're throwing noise into the um, case space or whatever is the encoded image, and I'm saying if you just take the if you just train on take your images decoded images, so don't even go to um, your uh, representation. So take your your kind of real space uh, yep. image and no add noise to it. Yep. And then run a, de a denoising out. Um, system that maybe is a learned denoiser that was trained on that same kind of data, right? By, by comparing the ah, ah, unnoisers. Ah, okay, okay. I think I understand. How, how much can you reduce noise with that versus doing, taking advantage of the sparsity? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, argument. now I understand. So, so that's a great question, actually. Um, I'm going to answer a question which I think is your question, and if it's not, correct me. So, you know, we, a lot of people who are working in this field say, well, you know it's, let's say Cartesian, you know it's Fourier, so just do a damn Fourier transform and then do the denoising in image space. And it's our contention that learning sparsity in multiple domains is a way to, to improve the reconstruction. So what we've done is we've actually separated those two things. We wanted to see how much of the performance boost is from the transform 
part. Remember, these things work together, so it's a little hard to split them. And how much of it is from the convolutional uh, hallucination final stages? And, and it turns out that the whole thing performs better than either the individual pieces. Okay. So, so I don't know if I exactly. Well, so I just, I guess, quantitatively, like if you say, you know, it seems like you typically get threefold SNR yeah. improvement. Um, if you were just to take the uh, kind of denoising uh, part of it in real space, how much, how much right. fold improvement? So do you I get? would say for Cartesian data, you do pretty well. But if you have a more complicated thing like spiral, where you're having to do something, you know, or an iter some other iterative reconstruction approach, AutoMap does better. I see. So you're and, saying you know, and and it's like factors of two ish. Okay. Um, but we can talk more about that. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful work. Thanks so much. Uh, right here. Going back to your question about um, uh, whether you could gain more uh, SNR by efficiently uh, uh, processing the data. Right. Um, what do you think is your uh, ultimate intrinsic gain? by these uh, techniques um, that's for really, low field. Yeah, so that's, so for us at low field, um, we're seeing factors of two, more than, little more than two. That's a lot. That's a lot, yes. exactly. Um, I don't know why it's not more, um, but again, it just really depends on where you operate. So you saw that plot that I did. And so yeah, for really noisy data, I guess I could have done less averaging and still have a better gain, but the images are still junk. So there's some, there's some sliding window where you have to set, okay, I want a minimum SNR of five or 10 or whatever you want. And then, then I think you would, what you might want to do is operate in a regime where you say undersample so that you achieve the minimum needed SNR to do the reconstruction if the goal is to save time. Right. And so, and the other question that may be naive, how does the uh, shape of noise from low field to high field impacts on your algorithm? So again, the network is not noise trained. So in fact, as long as it's, let me think of a better way to say this, AutoMap acts on data that is sensor domain like, okay? So it has all of the sparsity and all of the properties of the sensor domain that it's been trained on and it reconstructs into a domain that has all of the sparse properties that it's been trained on. And so things that are outside of that domain, it, it, it doesn't really look at, it doesn't see those things. And so if it is Ricean noise, if it is Poisson distributed noise, if it is Gaussian noise, as long as those things don't have the same sparsity in the domain of operation, it doesn't matter. So this is a very funny thing about AutoMap. Um, it, it, it is not noise trained. So, can I follow up with the question? Yeah, please. Uh, no, this is excellent. Suppose you have a, an external noise that comes and ah, sort right. of contaminates. So, so this is great. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so here's, here's my kind of way I think about all this stuff. So if you or I are sitting in front of the console and we see the case-based data and there's some, you know, frequency noise, right? Bright line, Christmas, you know, Christmas tree uh, frequency noise. You and I would say, oh, there's noise there, right? Because our neural networks know that that stuff is not image-like. Similarly, AutoMap does that as well. Okay. So we had some really interesting results that I, I just saw for the first time last week where there was some little frequency glitching in our low field scanner and, on one slice and the network basically just took it out because it said this doesn't look like, again, I don't mean to use this anthropomorphic language. I can switch back to more grounded language if you want, but it's convenient. Um, it, this doesn't look like the stuff I've been trained on, so I'm going to just kick it out. Similarly, if you want to do uh, motion robust reconstruction, right, you can train it on um, an image and then motion corrupted versions in the sensor domain, all sorts of different realistic motions and all sorts of different things, and that works, actually. Another group has shown that. You, it's not perfect, but you can learn to separate motion from not motion. And, and so my, my kind of guiding, guiding principles is, is if you and I could, could tell the difference, these type of approaches will learn to reconstruct it. If like it's more subtle than that, then, then I don't know, I can't say anything. And in reverse, you could also monitor the motion if you could remove it. That's right, what? that's right, okay. that's exactly right. So, okay. so yeah, and again, this is a, this is a non, you know, this is a prospective motion, you know, this is just, just this motion doesn't look anything like I've ever seen, so let's just not operate on it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes. 
Very quick question. Fantastic work. So, can you comment uh, some practical issues? For for example, like uh, some systems always imperfect. So, for example, the B one B zero homogeneity engineering part. How to affect yeah, your yeah. like uh, so, training everything? Right. Or? So that's a great question too. Um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, and then I'll, then I'm going to come back to it. Um, so again, you know, we've been training this network on. Uh, basically assuming that the thing we want to reconstruct is image-like, right? And all natural images are kind of the same, brains, cats, dogs, whatever. Um, if you want to reconstruct things that look a little different, let's say um, temperature maps, right? MR-derived temperature maps. So temperature maps don't look anything like regular natural images, right? They obey the heat equation. They have a certain kind of smoothness and things like that. And so if you want to reconstruct things like that, um, you probably need to train properly in domain, okay? Your question was a little different than that. Your question was about how much does B0 and B1 and those things really matter? And again, you know, it depends on what kind of artifacts they introduce. So like if we have a terrible coil, which we never have terrible coils in my lab, really. But if we had an arcing coil that did some you know, weird thing um, that didn't look like typical trained case-based data, it would probably, uh, remove or slightly mitigate, or mitigate that. Um, in practice, we don't have to do anything special. So, so we've reconstructed data that comes off clinical GE3T scanners, um, from clinical 3T semen scanners, you know, high B value diffusion, our stuff at ultra low field, and a homemade scanner that's in the ground in College Station, and they, it works just fine. Now, if you want to do something really interesting, like, um, you know, have a very, you want to build a new scanner, right, that has super inhomogeneous B0, maybe single-sided B1, maybe nonlinear gradients, that would be really hard to reconstruct. If you could write down a forward model, okay, you could generate a training set, and you could reconstruct that data single pass as well. So if you, if you have problems, to summarize, if you have problems that are affecting the imaging, but you can parameterize them with a forward model, you should be able to ge generate a training corpus that allows you to mitigate those on the reconstruction side. Wow, that's a good, that's good.